So in this lecture, we're going to be exploring the earliest settlements of North America and then the subsequent migrations that take place throughout the Americas. And we'll meet some of the native peoples and the civilizations that develop uh, in, in Native American societies. But we're going to have a problem because most of these societies, as a matter of fact, all of these societies don't have any kind of written language, at least, that has survived and come down to us that we can understand. So we're going to be relying on basically archaeological evidence for the earliest portions of this lecture, and as well as, or as well as as uh, European observations of of what these these uh, cultures and peoples could uh, could tell them. So it's uh, going to be largely secondhand and uh, what bare archaeology can tell us and what anthropologists have speculated about the settlement of early North America. And along with this, then we're going to enter into the age of colonization of uh, North America and sort of the French, Dutch, and English, and the earliest portions of the English settlements of North America, and uh, and how relations with natives uh, began and sort of the development of fur trade and then the subsequent development of agricultural production of luxury goods such as sugar and tobacco and how this shaped the new world and how colonies developed into empire for many of these nations and competing factions between the Spanish, the French, the Dutch, and the English uh, for control of, of uh, strategic positions, colonies, and lucrative trade that transformed from uh, regional trade to an entirely global network of, of uh, luxury goods that were shipped to Europe and, and goods that were moved back and forth by these brand new companies like the West India Company, the Royal Africa Company, and the East India Company. So we're going to begin to see the emergence of a, of a globalized world in, in, a, in a sense here uh, with, the tr with trade, empire, and colonization. So I look forward to going through this with you in these slides. We need to begin this lecture just by kind of taking, taking a moment and understanding that the history of the United States did not begin with European exploration as is often uh, put forward in, in many courses, um, but rather it is part of a vastly larger history from uh, going all the way back into the ancient world and times of uh, prehistory where Stone Age human beings came across uh, either the Bering Strait or uh, from, by some other means and began the settlement of the Americas and the Europeans, of course, as they, they began exploring the New World at the end of the 15th century, uh, discovered uh, many civilizations, vast civilizations, complex societies uh, that had been settled and in this place as long as their own societies that they came from in Europe. So let us begin by looking at some of the earliest theories of migration to the Americas. So ancient humans uh, as came out of Africa. Uh, it is, this is the, uh, the current scholarly theory, although it has been challenged uh, by numerous discoveries throughout the world. But the earliest human beings come out of Africa and settle somewhere um, in the Eurasian uh, steppes. From there, we began to see migrations of human beings, which and this is Stone Age human beings, uh, all the way uh, into Europe and across the, uh, the Eurasian steppes into Siberia and eventually uh, moving across the uh, the Bering Strait, which would have been glaciated over in, in the last ice age around the uh, uh, around fifteen thousand years ago ish, and these are all very approximate dates, uh, and I don't uh, purport to be a great expert in prehistory, um, but nevertheless, this is the conventional theory that um, human beings came from the Eurasian steppes uh, all the way into North America, pursuing game. Uh, and uh, and the, from from these people came all of uh, the the uh, peoples of the Americas. And when glaciation uh, ceased, that or uh, you know when when uh, when the glaciers receded at the end of the ice age, uh, and, and this cut off uh, the new world, the Americas, from the old world, and relations there ceased, uh, or so scholars have speculated. Um, and the, the cross-pollination and the subsequent migrations that might have taken place 
uh, ended entirely um, at, uh, at, the, at the point of when the land masses diverged and, and it became, um, became independent societies. So here you can see that around the year 14,000 BC, again, always approximate dates, that this is the Beringia theory um, that humans walked across the Bering Strait, that it was not, um, it was not probably a movement by by sea but rather it was hunter gatherers who were moving across the bering strait landmass uh, that we we just uh, looked at and that they were pursuing large game such as mammoths um, or, or uh, yeah, reindeer wh whatever it might be um, that they then in a series of continuous migrations began to move south across north america and eventually settled uh, uh, settled in various regions and other peoples moved from this and to other places. Um, there are other theories as well that uh, there, there was ac it was actually uh, a sea route that was taken into the Americas or that there was a combination of, of uh, movements that, uh, that early peoples moved over land and over sea and that there was, there was this continuous series of migrations uh, through using both land and sea. And there's even one theory that uh, the people came from Europe. So there was an Atlantic sea route theory uh, uh, based upon archaeological finds um, in caves in, in, uh, in the regions of, uh, of North South Carolina. That uh, there were some European DNA that has, has thrown into uh, the very early peoples that has, has uh, caused problems in, in understanding how, um, how the earliest humans came into and settled North America. So it's really up in the air to a large degree, but, but uh, the, the generally accepted theory is that Asiatic peoples moved across the Bering Strait. Though if you wish to pursue this further, there are of course competing theories uh, about this. So as, as I said here, as, as uh, humans migrated across the Bering Strait, as they came to settle in, the North, uh, in, in North America, they moved south quite quickly and they began to develop into their own groups. So we see here a linguistic transformation from, from uh, a common tongue, pr uh, probably, uh, into many other languages and the development of, of, uh, of differing languages as well as the formation of societies and distinct cultures throughout North America. And this is over millennia. This is not uh, overnight, but this is a slow migration and a divergence of cultures, languages, and then the, uh, the formation of differing societies. So this gets us to the period of when North American peoples, as we will call them, the Native Americans, uh, as Europeans uh, found them. And the, the settled peoples began to form uh, tribal groups, large confederations that spoke a common language. So we might think of uh, the, the Cheyenne or the Sioux, uh, the, the Iroquois, or you know, so, uh, large linguistic groups uh, that, that formed uh, tribal groups. And these had relations with other groups, and, and it was uh, diplomacy that had to take place. Some of these people were more settled people. Some were more hunter-gatherer, remained in more traditional lifestyles. Um, but they differed enormously, but we don't see, for the most part, large urban centers being developed among, uh, among native groups, but rather that they were a more, much more tribal existence. Although uh, archaeologists and anthropologists have made discoveries of urban centers uh, on the Great Plains, they have made uh, discoveries of urban centers uh, in, in the Great Lakes region. So uh, it's really unclear because we don't have written records of what is going on um, in, in these societies. So our knowledge of this is, is very much just based upon rogue archaeological finds uh, and theorization. But, uh, but certainly there is evidence of some urban settlements among uh, native populations. Uh, but for the large part, this is going to be a much more rural, small, uh, nomadic, uh, ex maybe not nomadic, uh, but certainly uh, a smaller rural existence uh, of, these, of these people. And it's going to be a joint combination between um, hunter-gatherer uh, as well as uh, agriculture.
that uh, we do see evidence of, of planting of crops and, uh, and fixed settlements. But these people would move around uh, as game and, and, uh, and, and uh, weather patterns, environmental um, uh, changes force them to do. And as I said, each one of these kind of linguistic groups or, or uh, confederations, as we might call them, uh, that, uh, that they spoke a, a common dialect in, in many cases, not all cases, um, but they would come together and that they would form groups. So we think of the Iroquois Native Americans. Um, well, really, the Iroquois is just a bigger confederation for a much more complex uh, diplomatic categorization of a group. So the Iroquois nation, as we might, as they're sometimes referred to, is actually made up of five individual tribal groups, and that is the Seneca, the Cuyahoga, the Oneida, uh, the Oneida, and the Mohawk, or the Ontonaga, and the Mohawk Indian uh, uh, tribes. So each one of these groups came together to form a, a diplomatic group uh, in order to uh, have peaceful relations as well as uh, economic relationships for uh, specifically uh, later on it will come for the fur trade but to, to clear delineations of their their boundaries and and simply to have sort of this this uh, diplomatic relationship and among these cultures we see the development of complex uh, religions we see um, we actually see a much more powerful matriarchal culture among the Iroquois groups that uh, oftentimes the women were the ones who made the decisions on when the tribe moved, where they moved, and, and uh, how they were going to approach um, their, their, their planning for the future and what crops would be sown, uh, where they would hunt, or where they, to where they would move for game. So we, we do see a much more powerful matriarchal presence among some of these tribes uh, in everything except war. And, uh, and that, that is very much the province of, of, uh, of males uh, in, in, uh, in these native societies. But we do see a gr much greater participation of women uh, in leadership roles uh, and, and, and uh, in consultation with the, the males of the tribes, um, certainly within the Iroquois, and they're quite, quite famous for this. Now we must uh, think on, uh, as Europeans observed uh, Native Americans and their, as they're often presented to us in, in popular culture, um, that there's sort of this nostalgic notion of these, uh, these great tribal peoples who lived together and it was a bucolic existence, that they all got along perfectly, that they lived in harmony with nature, that uh, everything just went well and they managed everything perfectly and it was sort of this just wonderful egalitarian society where everyone sort of had uh, equality. And that's just simply not the case. Um, as we read accounts of of uh, Native American societies uh, that they were perpetually at war with other societies. They took uh, other peoples as slaves that they were often uh, brutally treated by, by each other in, in times of war. Uh, sometimes not, but, uh, but in many cases that they were. Uh, they had these violent rituals uh, towards, uh, uh, the, the, uh, toward manhood where, where oftentimes uh, the young boys were suspended by their, uh, their pectoral muscles up uh, uh, that, uh, that um, needles were run through their pectoral muscles and they were suspended from the ceiling. So that there, it was not always a, a placid uh, and peaceful bucolic existence among these societies. And also as we, we think back on sort of popular conceptions of Plains tribe Indians, um, well, they don't, um, they don't actually get horses until the Spanish show up. So uh, the, the Sioux, you know, as we think of, of the great encounters with the, the U.S. cavalry on the Plains in, in the 19th century, um, well, the, the Sioux tribes did not even have any horses until at least the 16th century and probably were not uh, living in their, their as we think of, their traditional nomadic existence um, until the 17th century, where there are these fearsome warriors on that uh, were uh, rode bareback across the, the Great Plains of the United States. They, they were not, uh, they were not uh, mounted warriors. Uh, the fearsome people that are encountered by Europeans um, until much later in, in uh, colonial history. 
So uh, we have to really be careful when we think of them uh, as, as uh, living in this sort of uh, existence where they would hunt buffalo uh, and they would uh, and they had this culture of moving with the buffalo herds and hunting them on horseback. Um, this, this, uh, this could not have existed until at least the 16th century. So that there was far different types of societies and some archaeologists have even uh, made discoveries in, uh, in Kansas uh, as well as the, the state of, I believe it is Oklahoma, uh, of, of uh, large settlements. So uh, actually these, these, uh, these nomadic tribal uh, groups such as the Sioux or the, the Crow, and, uh, uh, that they would move not uh, with the animal herds, but rather they had some sort of fixed existence. And it's very difficult to say because we don't have any writing uh, to tell us about these things other than European observers who come much later when they're living in a different manner, uh, when they would move with these great buffalo herds across the plains. So we do, as, I, as I'm mentioning this, the uh, urban centers of the Great Plains, um, we certainly have evidence that there were large centers of, of people living together um, in, in uh, areas of, of present-day St. Louis, which is the Cahokia, uh, which is, uh, is the, the name of the, the largest urban center for the Mississippi Mound culture, that, uh, and this is a definition given um, by anthropologists because we have discoveries all over the southeastern United States of uh, these large mound uh, regions, these settlement areas where it develops sort of this common culture. We see uh, similar artifacts and we see the beginnings of this culture around the year 900 uh, of uh, European dating and, and uh, we see an end of the Cahokia civilization by 1350. But what caused uh, or, or what was this? Well, it was a large urban center having between, uh, archaeologists estimate, between 12,000 and 16,000 inhabitants. And it was sort of this capital city, if you will, of this much larger Mississippian culture. And it, it was a thriving culture uh, until around the year 13. 50, when we see its uh, abandonment due to an exhaustion of, of the land as well as game, environmental uh, transformations. This is also the time that we have of the Little Ice Age in, in, uh, in Europe when we see the, the advent of the Black Death and, and similar things like this. Um, so it is likely that environmental uh, transformation uh, environmental uh, shift that the land got much colder or the area got much colder and therefore it caused this area to uh, not be able to support a very large urban center so it was entirely abandoned by the year around the year 1350. So now let us shift our attention from the native societies uh, to their encounter with Europeans. So we have already gone through this exhaustively with the Spanish, but we have paid very little attention to other northern Europeans, such as French, uh, the French, the Dutch, and, and the English. So we're going to take a look at, at that. And Europeans began in, uh, in the year uh, 1492. They discovered the New World, and the Spanish uh, gained for themselves a massive empire with the richest portion and the spoils of the New World, at least in, in the sense of uh, gaining the, the prime bullion producing areas of the world in South America as well as Mexico and the choicest colonies of the Caribbean. Um, but nevertheless, the French and the Dutch and uh, to some degree the English, the English were really the last players in the game, um, but the, certainly the French and the Dutch do not waste any time in, uh, in moving toward the new world. And they wanted to move along latitude lines that were similar to their own home nations. Uh, and latitude, remember, is this sort of uh, this, this drawn line along a map that uh, modern cartographers have used in order to, uh, to navigate. Uh, and modern explorers used to navigate. And, and uh, so therefore, 40 degrees uh, north latitude is going to be a artificial line that is drawn by mappers in order to be able to plot your place uh, where you are uh, among the oceans uh, or on land. So um, Europeans estimated that 
by traveling along your own latitude that the weather patterns, the climate would be very similar to what they enjoyed in Europe. So this would mean if you moved along uh, the, the same latitude as you left France uh, in, that when you sailed into Newfoundland, Canada, um, that it would be a very similar climate. There, at least this is what they estimated or what they, they projected. And they could, of course, be, be no wrong, or no more wrong than what they were, as vicious winners that they faced. Uh, the English uh, speculated uh, the same thing as well as the Dutch. And uh, this was conventional academic theory at the time. Uh, and, of course, they found a vast uh, Arctic uh, wilderness instead of the more, much more temperate climates that uh, are found in England, even Scotland, as well as France and certainly Spain. So the weather is, is much, much different, and this was, this was found to be uh, wrong. So quite quickly, European explorers, the earliest uh, uh, French uh, explorers, found that they could not live or, or uh, exist in the same way as they could in, uh, in Europe. So therefore, the French and the Dutch established sort of key ports uh, along the, the uh the Atlantic seaboard of North America, as well as exploring down the St. Lawrence, the current St. Lawrence River, uh, into the Hudson Bay, or, or, uh, and as well as uh, down into the Great Lakes region of North America. Eventually, the French would come all the way down through the Mississippi Valley and or the, the Mississippi River Basin, all the way down into present-day Louisiana and found the city of New Orleans, or as we call it, New Orleans at least in the South, and we people of the Midwest, we say New Orleans. So here I just wanted to show you the difference, of course, here in the Spanish Empire from what is left of the New World. So all that is left after the Spanish conquest of the New World, of course, the Spanish defeat uh, the Portuguese and gain uh, much of the of, uh, really all of the New World uh, with the a Peace Treaty. And so this vast, vast region, of course, is the Spanish Empire. And what is left for the French, the Dutch, uh, and the English is just this really uh, what was thought of to be just a, a, a unending wilderness that uh, no one really had wanted anything to do with uh, in, in, uh, in North America here, present-day United States. Uh, the Louisiana Territory would and uh, much of Canada would be uh, would be claimed by the French, the southwestern United States, all the way uh, to the northern regions of, of California, uh, would uh, would be claimed by Spain, uh, and the British would claim a few uh, few uh, ports uh, and few key trading places along the uh, Atlantic seaboard, and the Dutch would also claim a few colonies such as New Amsterdam, present day New York, uh, along the Atlantic seaboard. So let us take a look here um, at uh, French exploration of the New World just very briefly. So really the, the big three explorers uh, for the French are going to be John Cabot, uh, Cartier, Jacques Cartier, as well as uh, Sa Samuel uh, de Champlain. And these fellows are going to, and I suppose Henry Hudson should get an honorary, an honorary mention in there as well. But uh, uh, Cabot is going to be the first of the French explorers. He's actually an Englishman who's employed by the French to, to come over and to map out the St. Lawrence uh, River, which is going to allow uh, the passage from the Atlantic into the, Gla the Great Lakes region. Uh, Cartier is going to come just a little bit later and, uh, and explore uh, much of, of the same areas, but going to move farther south. Uh, and then Champlain is going to come in and, and, uh, and he will, of course, discover the region of, well, Lake Champlain in upstate or in, in uh, up, uh, upper New England. And what did they discover here? Well, they discovered it was very cold. They discovered that they could not support any kind of crops that, as were grown in Europe, they discovered that no one really wanted to live in a vast Arctic wilderness, but it, and it was populated by large numbers of Native Americans. And what did it have to, to, uh, to give for the French? Well, soft gold, which was animal pelts, that, uh, that there were beaver uh, and minks, that were in abundance in the Great Lakes region and uh, throughout the north in the Hudson Bay area. 
And uh, this was what really interested the French, and that they could acquire enormous amounts of, of animal pelts and bring them back uh, to Europe, for which they used for hats and clothing. Uh, this was a, a very popular luxury item. This was how people kept warm in an age before clothes could be mass manufactured. And when you began to think about why that this was so important, um, the typical garment was not yet cotton. Right, so you don't have nice soft clothes, but it was rough, coarse wool. This is what almost everyone had to wear for their clothes, except the richest people. So, if you had the luxury of having, a, you know, a beaver pelt hat or, uh, a, you know, a beaver pelt uh, coat, a mink coat, something of this nature, uh, it was not only very warm; it was also very soft on your skin, and it was very nice. It was, a, it was a very important luxury good, and it takes many of these animals, of course, to to make these things uh, and it requires enormous amount of human effort to, to trap these animals as well as it's a finite population of these these animals and it has to be carefully managed uh, in order to uh, maintain the population so therefore they can be harvested uh, and and used for for human goods as abhorrent as we think this now um, this was uh, this was not uh, something uh, that was was uh, was awful in the ancient world, um, but it was a trade that was to be seized upon by by the French, especially and the English later, as well as the Dutch to some degree. Uh, but the French are the ones who are really playing the key part here in the fur trade. But very important and highly profitable. Along with this, the. French, the English, the Dutch always uh, sought the Northwest Passage, that Spain controlled uh, the way around, uh, the, the best ways around the New World. Uh, the, everyone hoped to find a way to the Far East, to China, to India, by finding a northern route, uh, the, the fabled Northwest Passage. West Passage. And as late as 1845, John Franklin and his famous expedition of men and their ghost ship uh, searched uh, that they would find a way through the north, navigating all of these islands north of Canada uh, to all the way to, to, uh, to China and, and, uh, and create a new and vast trade, uh, trade route um, that could you could bypass the Spanish and you would not have to go around the Horn of Africa, uh, but rather sail uh, sail north. And it would be much much shorter. Uh, alas, many men tried, many men died. Remember this this saying that many men tried, many men died uh, in order to trying to find the Northwest Passage, to which was never found in the ancient world. So colonization of the New World, we, we talked about this just, just a little bit earlier, but as you can see, the French are going to, to uh, control the vast majority here of, of Canada of, uh, on, on, uh, on out uh, into the western regions of Canada, the, the Louisiana Territory, which is, was just thought of in that day to be a vast wilderness that was unending uh, and uh, not really fit for settlement. Uh, so really outside of the Mississippi River Valley, uh, which comes comes down here along uh, present day Missouri uh, as well as into Louisiana and dumping out here in the Mississippi Delta in in present day New Orleans. Um, this was really the only region that was settled to any degree, at least early on. Uh, there are the odd forts, uh, you know, around in the the Great Lakes region, promoting trade of, of especially fur trade. But um, and and uh, the harvesting of timber and and this kind of thing. But uh, this is a vast wilderness, at least for the French, and really it's uh, uh, thought of to be largely a wilderness in the New England uh, and, and uh, Middle Colonies region uh, for for the English and and the Dutch. So really, other than just a few uh, colonies, select colonies here on the Atlantic seaboard of New England, uh, we really don't see much expansion, at least early on until until the 18th century. Uh, we don't see movement west to any large degree here. And it was very important uh, in order to strike up uh, trade deals with the Native Americans in the region uh, because they were ones who were there in vastly larger numbers than the Europeans. And there was the European traders who played a part um, in, in the fur trade. Um, but 
the natives, especially the Iroquois uh, Confederation, the Huron Confederation, tightly controlled um, the fur trade and the best hunting spots uh, and the harvesting of certain numbers of, of, uh, of these animals, of beavers, of minks, uh, and so on. Um, so therefore, it, the the Europeans were forced to make uh, trade deals with the with the the Native Americans, and it was much easier to allow the the uh, the Native Americans to harvest uh, the furs and simply to trade with them for other goods that uh, the the natives wanted, um, because it very frequently drew Europeans into conflict with Native Americans on account of. Um, the, the Europeans trying to push into the fur trade, and they did to some degree, um, but uh, it led to uh, warfare and, uh, um, uh, between both sides. Um, so it was not always a pleasant relationship, though it was a very profitable relationship when it worked well. And one of the earliest companies in the uh, in, for the uh, the French that the the English would uh, quite quickly take over was the Hudson Bay Company. And there grew to be, uh, there used to be, or in the earliest time, there were uh, monopolies. So a particular company would get a grant from, a, from a, a monarch in Europe that they would have the entirety of all the fur trade or, or any trade uh, in the new or old world. And that this company would then be the only one who could deal in fur trade in the areas. It would stifle competition. And we will have more on uh, colonial economics in, a, in another lecture. Um, but with the acquisition of the Hudson Bay Company and the by the English and much competition among other uh, trading nations, we began to see the growth of empire. And we began to see uh, each of these companies competing against each other nationalistic company. And we also see, of course, the Native Americans playing their part because, of course, this was their land first. Uh, and they had been there, and they were there in larger numbers, and they were not happy at all about uh, these Europeans trying to push their way uh, into these regions. And the, the, uh, the French will actually uh, garner the immortal hatred of the Iroquois when they executed uh, four of their chiefs um, in, in, uh, in really a, a uh, coup uh, that uh, there was supposed to be a peaceful diplomatic meeting, and they arrested and, and executed these, uh, these chiefs for uh, violations of their colonial rights. And therefore, the Iroquois turned uh, and were, became uh, uh, allies with the British, and uh, they would then help them in every subsequent war after that, uh, all the way up to the, uh, the French and Indian War, where where uh, the, the, uh, the British, over the course of the uh, 18th century, acquired much of, of uh, French Canada um, and, uh, and the French colonies, uh, everything but the Louisiana Territory. So the Dutch as well got into the colonization business, and as I had mentioned earlier, that they acquired uh, several very profitable and uh, cosmopolitan colonies that they would trade in, in timbers and agricultural goods, and uh, the most important of these uh, was uh, New Amsterdam, which is just off uh, Long Island here, uh, present day New York, and it would be renamed New York after the conclusion of the Second Anglo-Dutch War in 1664, and this, this ended uh, really any kind of Dutch presence in the New World that their colonies were shifted over uh, as well as their company was acquired by uh, the English. And it's sometimes strange that uh, the, the Netherlands, this region of Holland, Belgium, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, the, the, all the low countries uh, in this just very small region uh, in, uh, just north of France um, that they were able to create such a massive trading empire. They were highly successful traders at sea and if you have uh, the pleasure of visiting uh, Amsterdam or Bruges, uh, these, this was uh, the economic center of the world in the early um, 17th century. And it became one of the largest cities in Europe. It became one of the richest societies. Uh, and it was highly coveted uh, a place to do business. It was uh, relatively um, free thinking. You could, uh, you could get away with uh, practicing any kind of religion that you really wanted to, uh, to, to a degree. Um, and, uh, and that there were uh, 
many dozens of languages and people and merchants that were, were working together, that were trading, uh, they were making deals, uh, and this was all taking place in Amsterdam. And one of the, the, uh, the main reasons for this colonization is to bring in raw goods into Amsterdam where they are, are tra uh, transformed into uh, whatever it might be, furnitures or lo any luxury items uh, for, to, to be then taken from Amsterdam to, any, to many regions throughout the world. So um, it was a, a, a great loss, and, and we see the ebbing of, of uh, Dutch power with, the, uh, with, with their loss in war to, and especially their, their naval loss uh, to, the, to the English and the ceding of many of their colonies as well as their most profitable companies to the English. Also, we must turn our attention as well to the Caribbean because it's very important uh, here to, for the sugar trade. And remembering that the Spanish, of course, had the choicest and the largest and best of all of the islands, and uh, really the uh, the French, the Dutch, and the English have only just a f just the, the the scraps that were left over from the Spanish table here, and uh, the the uh, the English will will get uh, the key colony of Jamaica that they will be able to settle on, on that island as well as several uh, of the other uh, smaller islands such as Barbados. And the French will get uh, uh, Martinique, Saint Lucia, uh, as well as uh, uh, Saint Vincent, and it's sort of just at the end of, of the uh, in the, at the end of the Caribbean here, at the uh, at the end of the Antilles Isles. Um, and there's going to be um, the Dutch will will gain some some of these colonies, but for the most part, it's it's going to be just uh, the scraps of the of the Spanish table here. But what is different about the uh, the English, the French, uh, and the Dutch are that they began to set up large trading companies, and they began to uh, to appropriate these colonies for the production of raw goods and for commodities that can be traded because there was no gold. The Spanish, of course, remembering they found vast, vast amounts of gold to which they, uh, that, that was all sent to China, that they did not make investments in cash crops, they did not make uh, strategic investments in, in, uh, in sort of an economic policy or a building of infrastructure in Spain or the New World, that they used the vast majority of this wealth. Uh, to buy luxury goods from the Far East and therefore all of that wealth instead of staying in this region of the world or staying in Spain or even in Europe, um, it, it moved uh, into the Far East and only made the Chinese uh, and, and uh, Indians uh, far, more, uh, far more wealthy. <clears throat> so these, uh, these colony or these, uh, these nations uh, really made large investments, um, and I don't want to say that uh, the monarchies or nations made investments because for the most part these are private companies and I'm going to talk more about that uh, in a later lecture. Um, but each of these companies gains royal monopolies such as the East India Company, the West India Company, the Royal Africa Company. Um, and they're all going to get a monopoly on a particular trade region or item or uh, a particular good. The East India Company is the only company that can trade tea, uh, for instance. Uh, the Royal Africa Company is the only British company that can trade in slaves. Um, so each of these, these, uh, these companies are going to have protections on this so that therefore they don't have a fear of someone in coming in and undercutting them and, and, and destroying their, their hard work. Um, but it is going to be, of course, provided for by private citizens, and they will create this thing called a joint stock company in England to where uh, not only profits would be shared, but also um, the, uh, the, the, the risk of going into business is shared. So if there is massive failure, you don't lose everything. Uh, you only lose your portion that you, you paid into this. So if I, if I uh, a, a particular colonial venture or company costs a hundred dollars um, then I instead of having to be having if I am the proprietor having to put up the entirety of the hundred dollars I only have to put in ten dollars and I get uh, uh, nine more of my friends to put in ten dollars or someone to put in five or someone to put in two and we all uh, we all share the risk of this of this venture but also when it makes an enormous amount of money it makes a thousand dollars then we all get a hundred dollars instead of of uh, of me getting just a thousand dollars, we have to spread it out. It spreads risk. It also spreads 
uh, spreads profits. Uh, but nevertheless, these companies uh, and began to control uh, uh, colonies and trade of colonies, of sugar, of tobacco, of whatever it might be. Uh, and they become uh, quite profitable because they are continuously producing these goods that are then sent back to England or the Netherlands or France. Um, and instead of the Spanish bullion of just uh, the, the, uh, the gold coming in and then going out uh, for various luxury goods, these uh, sugar is turned into various uh, consumable things or uh, whatever it might be. Tobacco is transformed uh, into a, a product that you can then smoke and sell to other people. And, and, and timber, obviously, transformed into to whatever it might be, furniture, ships, homes. And, uh, but these raw goods move into England, into France, into the Netherlands, and that then they are turned into a product, and that is then traded back to the colonies. It is traded to other, other uh, areas uh, of the world, to other trading partners. But this is kind of the creation of empire, if you will, because it was thought of uh, that if you allowed other people to trade, other people to, uh, to use your, your raw materials, if you allowed... Um, competition that this was really bad and you had to it would be the, the destruction of your empire so you have to keep everything in the hands of your particular nation so the english for instance create this this highly protective um, law called the the navigation acts 1653 which forces all goods um, that are coming in or out of british colonies that they must pass through English shipping and they must originate from England. So if you harvest timber, you cannot sh uh, ship it on Dutch ships. You must use English shipping and it must be sent back to England. It cannot go to France. So this keeps the entire production line with under the English umbrella. Uh, the French do the same thing. The Dutch do the same things. Um, so this creates tariffs. So when you have to trade, uh, nobody wins in a tariff war uh, because other people just tariff you back. But it, it's this, uh, this insular uh, imperial thinking that you have to have empire in order to, uh, to grow economically. That rather than having a free market, you just simply have this closed imperial system of economics. And in this trading system, uh, the one key unit of production is sugar. Another key unit of production is tobacco for the English, Dutch, and, uh, well, not so much the French, uh, but really the English and Dutch colonies, and, or, well, the, the French in, in, uh, in the Caribbean is the productions of sugar and tobacco. And we see you have to have, of course, massive amounts of human labor in order to harvest uh, tobacco, in order to harvest, to harvest sugar. <laughs> which comes, grows in the cane, and it has to be boiled down, and it's quite a, a, a taxing and arduous process. And this is done by slave labor. And the earliest slaves, of course, were Native Americans that uh, Europeans would capture and force them to work on sugar plantations, um, whether it was direct chattel slavery or whether it was something more like indentured servitude where you were sort of forced to work no matter what. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it changes, and it's unclear exactly how this all develops everywhere, but it is different in different places. But nevertheless, it all leads to the same thing, that there is uh, a, the native population was forced to work at uh, little to no wages uh, for Europeans, and they died out at enormously high rates. It was actually discovered then that the importation of a readily available human commodity, the African slave, was far uh, hardier, uh, and and, uh, and this uh, these people were able to survive at much higher rates and work longer hours than the natives uh, that had been previously enslaved. So uh, Europeans began importing large numbers of African slaves to work on sugar plantations and then subsequently with the ending of the indentured servitude uh, trade from coming from Great Britain, it was much better to, or it was thought um, by the planters to have slaves than to try to use indentured servants from Great Britain. More on this later. 
But we began to see this thing called the, the triangular trade, the, the matrix of triangular trade here, that slaves would be imported from Africa to work in the Sugar Isles or uh, also in, in uh, the New England or uh, southern middle colonies. Um, so sugar or whatnot uh, would, uh, would move from the Caribbean Isles into the colonies, and then, of course, it would move back to Europe. So we, again, we see here this, this triangle, this triangular trade. Slaves, the production of raw goods, and then the raw goods move into Europe, and then from Europe we see the, the movement of manufactured goods, uh, textiles, furnitures, anything that we might, uh, might create from the raw goods from the colonies. So again, triangular trade here. Uh, and I just have put a map here of uh, African societies and tribal groups and we need to, of course, talk about the slave trade, and we will talk in depth about this later. Um, but there was constant and systemic warfare among African tribal groups, and they were only too happy to trans uh, transfer um, their captives in war to the coast where they were then sold into slavery. So the origins of the African slave trade actually comes from endemic tribal warfare uh, among African groups who were then all too happy to sell uh, their, their captives of war, uh, which has been a, a very long, uh, his, there's a very long history to this. I mean, all the way back into the most ancient empire, the Persia, Rome, uh, Greece, uh, uh, that uh, when a, a rival army would uh, capture a particular settlement, that uh, not only would they take the spoils of war of, of material goods, but they would uh, take many of the people, and that they would then sell them into slavery. This is an institution that is as old as human societies. So uh, this is not unique uh, to the African uh, continent, um, but it, uh, it, it, it becomes particularly grotesque, um, and as well as being... Um, at least in, in uh, the New World, as becoming uh, centered on race instead of just you are a spoil of war, which was very common throughout, uh, throughout uh, the ancient world. It was not based upon a particular ethnicity, um, rather, uh, but uh, the importation of vast, vast numbers of, of uh, Africans uh, to work because of their adaptability to the tropical conditions allowed uh, or created a system of, uh, of racial or eth uh, ethnic slavery that was, is very unique um, to, the, to the New World. So here you can see uh, the numbers of slaves uh, that were imported. So here we're seeing, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of of, uh, of Africans that were uh, were transported across this uh, the dreaded uh, Middle Passage here uh, from various portions of Africa uh, into the uh, into the New World, and the vast vast majority of these slaves are going to be sent to work in on uh, the sugar plantations, which is has a very high mortality rate, very dangerous and hard work um, that uh, that saw the deaths of hundreds of thousands of, of people who who had no access to medicine, uh, who were, were brutally treated and, and uh, worked uh, worked to death in many, many cases. So slavery is unquestionably the great moral evil of our modern times and we live in a, uh, a world of egalitarianism that if we believe that all people who are created equal uh, who are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights chief among these being the right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness then we must say that uh, slavery is a great moral evil and that it should be rooted out of all of our our societies uh, but this experience of slavery in the ancient world that not everyone thought this way as, as exactly as we think now or as the founders of the United States or some of them at least thought uh, or at least had the theory of. So this, the experience of, of uh, the slave trade is one of absolute uh, uh, horror for the slave. Of course, they were forced. You can see here a drawing of a slave ship forced into these, these small decks that were so, uh, so compact that uh, it, you could not even stand up. You were often chained. Uh, you were forced to lay in your own uh, feces and, and urine through a uh, six-week uh, journey across the ocean. People would die in this time. The, that um, children, women, men were all uh, subjected to these same things. Uh, you were maybe oftentimes uh, naked as you were on this ship. You very, very rarely got to come out of your cabin. You were fed an absolute... Um, 
the smallest amount of food that could possibly be spared. You were given no medical attention. You were treated as though you were chattel and animals, or worse than animals in some cases. Um, it was just a barbaric thing to do. Um, we have in the writings of uh, John Newton, actually the composer of the song Amazing Grace, and he was a captain of a slave ship and a slave trader uh, much of his life. And he talks about the horrors of, of the slave trade and how uh, his, uh, his, uh, his Christianity actually informs him that he eventually was doing the wrong thing. Uh, he was doing a horrible thing and that he comes out as one of the most uh, vehement opponents against slavery and he played uh, an enormous role in, uh, in the ending of the slave trade uh, for Great Britain in the late uh, 18th century along with William Wilberforce. Um, but uh, this was an institution that was uh, was Im was an immense economic colossus uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries, and uh, human cargoes were were highly sought after, even by uh, pirates. Who, when they found a slave ship, it's often said, you know, the pirates were sort of this uh, bucolic. Uh, society that uh, valued egalitarianism and whatnot, but uh, they would very often capture a slave ship and that they would sell the slaves. Blackbeard himself, the great Edward Thatch, uh, uh, the egalitarian thinker, captures slave ships all the time and he sells them uh, just as though that they were another, another commodity. So, so much for uh, the egalitarian pirate theory. Uh, but uh, it was just a brutal institution uh, that this passage uh, across the Atlantic that uh, you know, more than a th uh, often uh, a quarter to a third of the people died on this, uh, this, uh, this voyage and they were not uh, you know, given any, any rights uh, to, to, uh, to funeral. They were just simply tossed overboard off the ship uh, and they did not, uh, people did not care. They did not treat slaves as though that they were uh, human beings at all. So uh, just a, a terrible moral evil of our time. And once these slaves got to port, they were sold in auctions uh, and that they were treated just like animals who worked on a farm because that's almost exactly what they were. They were not human beings in any sense. Um, and their work days were very intense, that their families were separated. They were, uh, they were not uh, allowed to have any of the luxuries of, uh, of you would think of for uh, uh, human beings would deserve. They were uh, forced to work intensively, uh, normally six days a week, uh, 12 hours or more every day, and you were given a, a Sunday to rest. And this is, of course, uh, where most of the slaves would be doing most of the work. Uh, they would be grinding uh, and boiling down a sugar cane, uh, harvesting sugar cane. And this is an intensely physical and heavy activity. To, uh, it's uh, where many people were injured and died or bitten by snakes, poisonous spiders, things like that. There is no medical care. Um, and you had to work in the fields right alongside male, female, children, did not matter, all under the, uh, the whip of their masters, and slaves were uh, incredibly harshly treated um, by their masters uh, in order to be uh, out of fear, of course, uh, uh, they, that uh, the European masters, there were so many more slaves that they feared uh, uprisings, uh, so they had to, so they, they uh, intentionally treated slaves incredibly harshly in order to keep them uh, working uh, and keep them uh, in uh, peaceful and pa or pacified um, under the orders of the master. Tobacco plantations were similar, although the the uh, the mortality rates among slaves were not nearly as high in tobacco uh, tobacco farms because they were not in the Caribbean and having to deal with uh, mosquitoes and and uh, the same pests and and uh, diseases that come from uh, living in in the, in a tropical environment. So this is what we see in the uh, the southern and middle colonies in North America, and this is. Uh, the, the tobacco leaf is, of course, used to, to take and smoke in, in Europe and, and uh, traded throughout. Um, and it's really just a luxury good. Not everyone uh, would, uh, would uh, enter into this, uh, this uh, smoking relationship. Uh, King James uh, I hated it. Uh, but nevertheless, it became enormously popular and a lucrative trade uh, throughout Europe. So here we see um, the emergence of sort of this globalism, these globalized trade routes, um, and, and this is the dawn of imperialism, that this is something that is different. 
colonialism is one thing and Europe uh, and, and, uh, and imperialism is another. That we see a transformation here from the establishment of a few colonies where people would go to live, to harvest a few, uh, or, you know, to, to become farmers or seek freedom or whatever it is, um, to, to European nations transforming their policy to one of imperial management where this is a vital part of their their economic and social expansion uh, and that their uh, hegemony or their political hegemony over other portions of the world so it was vital to them economically it was vital um, to their their growth as uh, as world powers and hegemony i think there is something to say Say that there is an absolute in in uh, human uh, human societies from the dawn of history, and that is the will to dominate, the will to dominate other peoples. And this, I think it's it's sad to some degree, uh, but nevertheless, it is there. So never underestimate this when we see the dawn of imperialism. That that uh, this was how uh, nations would grow and prosper. And then this is uh, we we will speak more about uh, imperialism, um, but it was a growth of a national fervor that the nation state was was uh, was coming of age that there it, the nation was something more um, than just uh, a monarch but it was a people and these people needed to expand that they were ethnocentric or this is ethnocentrism that um, that people were uh, a particular nation state was the greatest and best people and that by expanding, by growing, by getting richer, um, by expanding your culture on other people, um, you became uh, the most powerful, the most hegemonic, um, and the best. And, the, and these were mutually reinforcing that you believed this, but also uh, when you saw this happening, it was, it was reinforcing your theory that, well, God has chosen you to be the best. You were the best because... Uh, your culture has prospered over other cultures, and there was a tenacious uh, drive to uh, protect these these uh, imperial relations and and the growth of of uh, the economies that came from this. So we begin to see in the seventeenth century the ebbing of Spanish con of Spanish dominance uh, in the New World, and we see the growth really of the English and the French, uh, and then by the uh, 18th century, we see the emergence of the British Empire uh, in the Atlantic world uh, and, and become, uh, growing to eclipse uh, both France and uh, the Netherlands, and especially Spain, who had never made the investments uh, in, in, um, in trade, trade goods, in the same way that uh, the English and Dutch had. So thank you for watching, and I hope you now have a better understanding of colonization and imperialism. Thank you.